uh, satsang is a reminder. It's a reminder and a set of descriptions. Uh, descriptions that hopefully guide us to see, th see things that we have overlooked. Descriptions or pointers that allow life to be seen differently. In such a way that we almost see the fabric of life differently. The structure of life differently to how it used to be seen. Not just um, in relation to our interpretation mentally, but the whole interpretation on a, on a felt sense. It's because our sense of who we are changes. And the sense of who we are that suffers, the identity that suffers, really is a set of beliefs. And beliefs, um, you know, that's a word that I'm using, a belief. But what is a belief really is, is very hard for us to understand un until we really start feeling the changes that happen when beliefs change. Um, and very hard for us to understand um, until the n nuances of beliefs are actually seen. You know, I asked someone today, what um, makes you believe in the Christian-like God idea? I was curious because, you know, they were talking about it. Um, and I could feel that they really believed it, it's sort of in a good way for them. I think it actually serves um, a purpose. And I'm uh, quite familiar with the structure of belief. And so it's very obvious that the person believes in God. Now, I'm not talking about God, your God, or my God, but their God, the idea of God. So I asked, I said, what makes you, on what basis do you believe in that Christian-like God? I didn't get an answer. This was over uh, a message uh, system. I didn't get an answer yet. And what I'm hoping is that the person has a bit of a light bulb moment when they consider the question, like, on what basis, like, what is it that supports or makes you feel comfortable believing in the God that will judge you once you die um, based on how many good or bad things you have done, because that is the idea that the person has. So I was curious, I'm curious, like, oh, so why do you believe that? Why? Um, like, I'm really genuinely curious. Because one of the big wake-up moments was to realize for oneself and see one's own beliefs. I can't emphasize how important and significant that is to understand what a belief is. A belief is when you believe, when, you, when you're certain about something and you really have um, very little grounds on which to be certain about it, and yet you are. <laughs> and um, one of the ways that we can see our beliefs is if we're very certain about something and then someone gives us some information about the topic and suddenly we change our view on it. And in that moment when we change our view and we realize that we were wrong and it's our own 
not someone doesn't have to convince us it's not about beating us into changing our view let's say the information just comes in in a in a way where it just lands oh i hadn't considered that piece of information um i was interpreting the topic without that information now i get that information and everything's different and we change our view and in that moment we might realize wow i believed unquestioningly something that was wrong because now i now i see something different now i've changed my stance um and that can be uh really powerful it it can happen for people a lot and it won't happen in a sharp way that makes us realize we're always changing our mind about things but sometimes this is these are the fortunate things in life is when something just hits you and you realize that's what realization is It's like you realize that in an instant you changed a view that you held for your whole life because some new information came in about something mundane let's you can leave god out of it just about um you know the objectiveness of some information that you had heard a long time ago on a documentary and it was presented a certain way and your system just said oh this is the way it is and then you hear another documentary that presents a completely different angle and you've never heard anything um from that angle and it sounds very convincing and in that moment it's like i don't know what to believe and we might realize for the first time this um movement of belief which is to be sure about something that actually isn't absolute and there's nothing in life that is absolute so this um uh topic of belief required for me um the notion of relative and absolute to be introduced something for the working mind to contemplate and with um so the a- absolute means unchanging essentially if if something is is real even if you use the word real in a certain way your definition of real in a certain context can be that which doesn't change that which is um not subjective that which is not relative which means it is known absolutely it means we have no missing information about a topic so if we say i am absolutely certain and we use the word absolutely it means there is no space for any doubt now that's bad thinking if we make that mistake we haven't realized the relativeness of information that we have on something we always have a very limited amount of information or information seen from a certain angle or information given to us from a certain um source and that source often often has its own agenda or is trying to make a specific point and so when we receive information we might not realize that we receive information often because someone's trying to make a point and if the point changes still within the same topic we might hang on to that information not realizing that we're arguing over a different point and thinking oh no that information i have is relevant to this new point but it's relative information to a specific point let's say of a specific argument that was being made or um so there's a lot of different ways in which we can start to see the relativity of the information we have and if our information is relative our conclusions have to be relative meaning not absolute um if new information comes in it can add to our thinking which means our thinking before the new information comes in wasn't complete and when we think about this we'll realize it's never going to be complete i'm never going to have 
all the information on something. And then even the notion of information. If we did have all the information, then do we know the thing absolutely? And we'll start maybe thinking, no, because information gets processed by my um, faculties, let's say the brain, and the brain itself is relative. What if the brain doesn't consider something? And so we see, oh, if I'm um, hearing information, it's coming through a relative um, set of uh, machinery. What I see is relative, dependent on my eyes. You know, someone can have 20-20 vision, someone can have um, be short-sighted, and whatever they see is dependent on their seeing capacity. And so then we might make the mistake of thinking, oh, I have 20-20 vision, so that's I'm seeing everything truly. So if you compare it to X-ray vision, your 20-20 vision is very limited and very relative. So not only do we have limited information, the information comes through um, limited faculties and then is processed by another limited faculty. So everything, our feelings, are based on an interpretation of a situation. And it's completely relative. It's, so another word is subjective. Another word that goes along with relative it's not absolute. How we relate to a situation is going to be different to how someone else relates to a situation. How we relate today will be different to how we related five years ago. And it's always subject to change. So basically, once we realize everything in life that we know is subjective, is relative, is not absolute... I mean, just in case you're wondering, I thought about this topic for maybe five or six months every day for 10 hours a day. I'm not joking. You start to see things differently when the thinking and the contemplating and the observing along all of the new bits of information that are coming in that we think about and we draw conclusions that are beyond the information that came in. That's what our intellect, our contemplating mind, which is part of the working mind, is capable of doing. It gets a lead and then it thinks about it and it fleshes out that lead and it becomes much more proficient on that topic that it's been thinking about. And the irony is that the more we think about thinking, the more we see how limited and flawed it is. So the thinking about thinking is not to make your thinking perfect, but to see its nature. If we come to this conclusion about our feelings, our thoughts, our perceptions, is it true? And if our intellect hasn't been equipped with an understanding about the relativity of um, our whole experience, then if we asked ourselves the question, is it true? We may say, yes, it's true. I can touch it. You know, that's one of the things that we say, oh, if I, if I can, if to see it might be relative, but once I touch it, then I know it's real. You know, touch is just another sensation. It's no less relative than sight. But our intellect might say, no, if I can touch it, if I can feel it, it's real. But if I'm just 
witnessing an image, a visual image, then it's maybe not so real. But as soon as I touch it, then it's real. Touch is just a sensation. It's dependent on your nerve endings and how the brain processes the touch. You know, if you if close your eyes and someone gets you to do something with your finger in a certain way, your sense of touch can be very deceive, deceptive. It can make you think that, um, you know, someone's finger has moved all the way up and down your arm when in fact it's only moved within a win inch of where it started. So if our intellect hasn't thought about these concepts, really contemplated them, then we don't have our own information to, if someone says, is this true? Is what you think true? And you go, no, it's not. What does it mean by, is it true? It doesn't mean, is it somewhat accurate? That's a different statement. Because you can have relative inf information about something that is relative information that you've observed consistently about something, seen it from um, different angles, and you can then describe it and understand it's a relative description. And you can say it's an accurate description. Now, accurate means if we, depending on how we hold the word, accurate, f and we know it's accurate, as far as a relative description goes of that thing from this angle relative to this point that I'm trying to make. So we go, oh, that's accurate information. Is it true? No. Someone might say, well, if it's not true, why should I listen to you? Oh, because it's accurate from a certain perspective and it's useful when you're doing a certain task to have that information. So because something is not true doesn't mean it's not useful because it's not true doesn't mean it might not be helpful and accurate from a certain perspective but there's um you know if we have a map and someone says you know this is a very accurate map i've tested it um in the field i've been out there in that piece of forest or um piece of countryside or city and it has great detail and I haven't found anything that's out of place so it's accurate now is it true no because accurate it might be but it it doesn't it isn't the thing itself right it doesn't have all of the contours and all of the details of the stones and the sand and even if it had the details of all of that they wouldn't be the thing itself in its complete form and we also have to understand that that map which i've been told is accurate may not be accurate just what they've told me is a concept that it's accurate now, I, now I'd say, well, is that concept true? No, the concept is never going to be true. And now I'll say, is it an accurate concept? Meaning, is the concept that says the map is accurate, is that accurate? It may be or it may not be. So I have to hold it like, I say, okay, I trust that person. They often give me accurate information. But I'm going to not risk my life on it absolutely like say definitely this is an accurate map we don't know it's an accurate map so we'll say i trust them they generally give me good information but i have to test it out for myself i have to go and see if it's an accurate map so we go out there one day and we use the map and we see that yes it's it's everything's in the right place so then we can have a concept for ourselves about the map being accurate but then we have to realize that our concept of the map being ac accurate isn't truth because we tested it out over the course of two days or three days when walking and we checked things and they were more or less in the same. And what if there's a little patch out here that we didn't check and it's not right? Then our concept that the map is accurate is not absolute. 
which doesn't mean we're going to get in trouble because it might be accurate enough. We might never go in that section where it's not accurate. So if we were to argue with someone, no, this is absolutely accurate. I've checked it. And then we don't realize you haven't really checked, checked, checked it. You've checked, you've used it and it's worked. So it's accurate enough, we can say. But we also understand that that concept of ours is relative. Now, this might seem like, what does this have to do with um, knowing myself as God or as awareness? Right? This has nothing to do with spirituality. I, this has everything to do <laughs> with coming to know yourself truly. Because the part of us that um, we could say doesn't know ourself, the part that obscures our connection to a deeper part of ourself makes all of these errors of thought, makes all of these errors of thinking, where it takes relative and assumes it to be absolute. And if this... Um, topic is not um, explored, then the belief systems, the belief about who we are, remains intact because the principle at the base of belief doesn't get seen by us to be flawed. And as soon as the principle of belief is seen to be flawed, all of the beliefs can start to crumble quite easily. So when we hear in spirituality, that it's not about going in and undoing every belief or undoing every trauma that's locked in the body. Um, it's about cutting the goidian knot, killing um, the plant at its root, the weeds, all of the weeds that stem out. If you had to go and pull out each weed individually, it would be a mission impossible. There'd always be another one growing. So that's a, um, a concept that is trying to point us in the direction that actually what we have to understand is something um, fundamental, something at the core, or something that on which everything else stands. And if we do that, if, we, if that foundation gets rocked, then the vast structure on top of the foundation can collapse much more efficiently than if we try dismantling the structure um, from the top, top down. Our silence inside <laughs> comes from understanding the relativeness of our thinking, of our feelings, of our sensations, the relativeness of everything that happens on the flow of life, the changeability. So impermanence is a concept that is often put forward. So don't worry, it'll come and it will go. That's one um, important reason impermanence is brought in, saying, you know, this too shall pass, it will, it'll change. So the nature of life on the surface is change, impermanence. You know, that's why the Buddhists will spend hours um, making the mandalas out of... Um, the colored grains of sand. And then at the end of it, they just mess it all up. Which is uh, cultivating this attitude of non-attachment. You know, the, the Western mind that is attached to outcomes would spend hours getting it perfect and then they'll build a wall around it 
you know, and lacquer it all in place and take photos of it and be protective of it and try to preserve it when its nature is not to be preserved. The wind is going to come, the rain is going to come, someone's going to come and kick it. It's going to change. And so this attitude of impermanence, understanding impermanence, means that attachment doesn't make sense once um, these concepts I'm talking about start permeating into our system because we've thought about them. And, and the topic starts getting fleshed out. And why is the topic introduced? The topic's introduced because it's completely relevant to the one thing that these talks are about, happiness for the human being in daily living. And I have to keep reminding, happiness isn't the happiness that we imagine. It's not the happiness that we usually word the word, use the word happy for. Happiness in this context means peace of mind, continuous unbroken peace of mind. And that peace of mind is there when there is a continuous unbroken connection to source. And that our continuous unbroken connection to source exists when this psychological identity that is made up of the misunderstanding about um, life and primarily a misunderstanding of what I'm speaking about here, the relativity of all of our faculties, the relativity of experience. And because the psychological identity doesn't understand relativity. It tries to solidify everything. That's why change is completely unacceptable to it. It hates the idea of change, and yet life is change. No wonder it feels uncomfortable in life. It wants certainty, and life is uncertain. It wants control. And life is uncontrollable because as soon as you control it, it's going to change. So our psycho the psychological identity simply doesn't understand, hasn't um, looked and seen the nature of life. And so spiritual teachings come along and start talking to not the psychological identity. The psychological identity is never going to get this. The spiritual teachings are being delivered to the working mind. Which we can say is another part of our intellect. And the Teachings are given to the working mind in a way that hopefully <clears throat> doesn't allow the information to be dragged out of the working mind into the thinking mind, into the psychological identity. Because if it does, then the psychological identity grabs the information and just turns it into, infects it essentially with the same misunderstanding that is at the core of this belief identity. So if the working mind hears the descriptions and understands the descriptions are concepts that are describing the dynamics of life that we need to see, the dynamics of life that we don't see. And so then it's the working mind that starts contemplating, says, I want, I want to understand life better. Now, the working mind isn't in control. You know? So, because the working mind wants to, doesn't mean it's going to understand. However, the working mind, if it starts functioning of its own, uh, in, its own in, it, in the way it's designed, and the working mind is there to, once it receives information, it will 
use the information and observe. And that observation automatically will give it more information. So if our contemplating, if the working mind is mm, shaped, guided, guided by the concepts themselves to function in healthy ways, understanding that the thinking is happening, that the outcome of the thinking is not in anyone's control, that the thinking is happening and the conclusions are follow-ons of the thinking. And any insight that happens, so an insight, an aha moment, is when the working mind has contemplated and come up with um, a better understanding of a dynamic. And then life delivers a circumstance that is perfect perfectly matched to the understanding that the working mind has, um, has gained as a, a result of its functioning. But remember, the working mind is a machine, so there's no one to claim any credit over it. That, that machine, that's what it does. It functions and it gains um, understanding. And then life comes along and delivers the perfect circumstance and the, the understanding sees the understanding it has, which is an intellectual, under, it sees it in the circumstance. And in that moment, there's a, a collapsing in a, in a way of the intellectual knowledge into deep insight. And that has an effect on our structure, that moment of insight really restructures the the system not in its entirety as in it, there can still be many blocks but in that moment of insight a block has been released and once a block has been released which means a section of the of the the energy system or the pipe work, you could say. So you can look at it like a whole series of pipes and there's a whole lot of blockages in the pipe. And um, in that moment of insight, one of the blockages is cleared out. And the blockage is cleared out in that moment of insight because the contemplating has been clearing out the blockage bit by bit. And and then it got to a weakened point. The, the blockage was um, not as as dense as it was previously. And the situation in life that presented itself perfectly, plus the understanding, is what just pushes the remaining block out. And then a flood of energy happens. And that flood of energy can be felt in your system. And it, it gives this hope for new blocks to start getting um, moved by that flood of energy. And as that happens, we see life differently and then we start thinking about things that um, present as we start seeing life differently. It's like getting numbers in a Sudoku puzzle. It's like you suddenly get one number and because you've got that square, you get another four numbers. And then because you've got those four numbers, you get a whole lot of follow-on effects. And then you get stuck again. <laughs> And you need to wait for the next number that hits. Oh, there. And then because you get that one, you get another three. So this contemplating has a, a flow-on flow on effect. So what are we contemplating at the moment? We're contemplating the relative nature of life. And if we see that our thinking is taking life, and what I mean by life, let's make it practical, um, <clears throat> the actions of another. If our thinking is interpreting those actions as absolute, when everything is actually relative, when the thinking is relating to our 
opinions, for example, as if they are absolute when everything is relative, then we might realize, oh, I've got this deepening understanding about the relativity of life because I've been contemplating it. So on the conscious level, we're now starting to play around with the relativity of life. And yet, in a particular moment, we might see that our attitude towards the actions of the other is based on how we feel. We can see, oh, there's no looseness around our interpretation of that action. And we might realize, oh, deep down I'm treating that action as absolute. What do I mean by treating the action as a absolute? Just saying, that is absolutely bad. Right? Not being able to see it from any un- other angle that loosens up our relationship to the actions of the other. You know, If we're sure that that is bad, we're relating to it absolutely. So I'm sure many of you have come across the um, parable of the Chinese farmer. The, um, so I won't go through it. Um, <clears throat> but essentially for uh, it's the maybe, the maybe parable. <clears throat> so there's a farmer and a whole series of events. Some of them seem very bad on the surface at first. Um, and his response when people say oh that's terrible i'm so sorry for you he says yeah maybe so his attitude is well maybe it's not as absolutely bad as you think i don't know maybe it's bad maybe it's not and so inevitably in the story something that turned out to seem very bad on the surface became the cause of something fortunate and so then the neighbors will come and say oh that's so fortunate you're so lucky and he Maybe. And inevitably in the story as it goes on, that fortunate thing then turns into something not so fortunate on the surface. And the neighbors say, oh, that's very unfortunate. Maybe. So this, this farmer has gone through over the course of an extended period of time a series of fairly extreme events. Some seem very um, unfortunate. And in that moment, he has to experience the unfortunateness. You know, um, animals dying, uh, broken legs, um, a son that, because of a broken leg, doesn't go to war, um, which is the positive thing, um, and so on. And so the farmer, in the moment, has to experience the pain of the situation and the pleasure of the winds. So the pain of the losses and the pleasure. But his attitude is, I'm not going to get involved in that pleasure or pain as if it's absolute. As soon as I do that, as soon as I get involved in the pleasure and pain as if it's an absolute thing, I lose myself in it. That's what the false belief in personal doership and attachment to outcome is always doing. It is attaching to pleasure And the reverse attachment, which is aversion to pain, because it believes that it is completely defined, meaning it will be added to by pleasurable circumstance and taken away from by negative circumstance. And so the tragedy is when this belief structure, which is based on poor thinking, really. We haven't been taught how to think. So spiritual teachings are doing, they're teaching us how to think. That's why this parable is, is there, to tell, maybe. And when we hear it, if it's our destiny to hear it, we go, ah, look at the truth in that parable. <laughs> maybe I shouldn't say look at the truth. Look at the, the accurate message in the parable. It hits us. Storytelling is a very powerful way of getting a message across. That's why the Bible has lots of parables in it. That's why in all different walks of life and different um, spiritual teachings, there are stories because we understand stories. They're not the truth. 
No spiritual teaching is telling you the truth. They're telling you stories. Even the spiritual teaching that says you are not the body, you are consciousness, you are awareness, that's a story. It's a concept. It can't be the truth. No concept can be the truth. So because this is so important, it's in the teaching. I, I say it often. Whatever I say is a concept. Whatever is written down in the teaching, in this teaching or any other teaching, is a concept. Any teaching from as far back in history as you can go and any teaching into the future will never be telling you the truth. They will be delivering concepts, which are pointers. Pointers that are working on specific blocks. And once a specific block falls away, that particular concept is not relevant anymore. And if we carry carry it forward, if we hang on to it as if it's the truth, because we make this mistake of treating relative stuff as truth, if we make that mistake, the teaching becomes a burden. It becomes an obstacle in itself. The concept is good when it's dealing, it's trying to make a specific point. So that's why um, in teaching they talk about skillful means, meeting someone where they are, understanding what the block is and delivering the concept that is appropriate. And so to one person you might say, look, you just have to relax. You're not the doer. You're, you're fighting life and you've got so much willpower and you're trying to control life and you're going, going, going. Just relax because that's their suffering. Just relax. Life will happen. You don't need to make it happen. Your happiness isn't to be found in um, that sort of functioning. In fact, that sort of functioning, if you really feel into it, is an uncomfortableness. It's going to wear you out eventually. You'll feel the uncomfortableness um, over time. So it'll say, you're not the doer, relax. And then there could be someone else who is de in despair, depressed, has no motivation to move in life, and telling them that they're not the doer may not be appropriate. What might be appropriate for that person is to hear that you, know, you are the one that has to make your life happen. You know, if you just get up and apply yourself, um, you might find that a different energetic um, feeling overcomes you. Just apply yourself for half a day on this project and see that you might find a new sense of... Um, of purpose come into your life. So, you know, if we treat them as if they, if we think it, the concept is truth, we'll go, okay, so no, now we have a problem. Which one is it? Which one of you is lying? <laughs> one of you must be telling the truth and the other must be lying. They're both concepts, so they, they can coexist. Because they're not the truth. They're not pretending to be the truth. They are a, a pointer for a, a specific problem. This is why I have no problem and with teachings that say something different to what I'm putting forward. Whatever a teaching says is a concept. So if I hold on to this teaching as a concept, if someone doesn't like it, well, that's okay. It's just a concept. If I think it's the truth and someone doesn't like it, now, now I have to defend it as being mine and they don't like it, so they don't like me. And so if another teaching says something different and I'm holding on to the concept um, and the teaching, then no, that's wrong. And we see that in spiritual seeking. Spiritual seekers... Um, tend often to become very protective of their own ideas, that the teachings that have delivered insight 
And so when that insight is taken to be absolute, which it isn't, even insight is not absolute, then we become sure that only this teaching, because it did this, um, is right. And we, don't, we haven't realized the relativeness of, what if I'm different to someone else? What if their problem, their blocks are different to mine? What if their personality and their temperament is different? They work by um, feeling and someone else works by thinking and someone el else works with discipline. So there are, there's the bhakti path of yoga, there's the jnana path of yoga, there's the meditation path of yoga, there's the um, uh, karma path of yoga. All different parts of yoga designed for different temperaments, designed for people at different stages of understanding. So then we can went welcome it all. It's like you have another path and we see that, ah, oh, this is actually all working in the interest of human awakening. So if we see that, it's working in the interest of human awakening, then why would we... Um, we, we can't see it as the enemy. So these are um, things we need to see in ourselves. So if we're a seeker that is always arguing about what someone says, and we realize, oh, they're just going through their phase. And if they're, if they're holding on to something really strongly, it's okay, they're just mistaking something relative for the truth. And that's what happens when... Um, when someone takes something relative for the truth, then, you know, they're going to be a bit dogmatic about it. And they're not the doer. They can't help it. That's how life has, is living through them at the moment. That's destiny unfolding. Someone commented on um, Facebook, I liked it, um, uh, not Facebook, on uh, YouTube, saying, I don't agree with this teaching. I like Roger, they said, but I don't agree with this teaching. And the funny thing is that that's the teaching. That's this, the teaching is, that's great. You don't have to like the teaching. You've got your own um, preferences. The teaching says everyone is going to have their own preferences and to think that everyone has to agree with what you agree with is to hate them. It's to insist that they be different. So as soon as you insist that someone's different and you hold on to that insistence, you're hating them. You're invalidating them. You're attacking them. That means you're attacking life which really means you're attacking yourself. Another of the um, teaching concepts that I'm sure people have come across in other teachings. So I'm bringing these other ones in to show you that in subtle ways, they're trying to get us to see this point I'm making of the relativity of things, or at least trying to loosen up our absoluteness towards things. So we've had the, we've spoken about the, the maybe parable is one. Now, what about everything happens for a reason? Or in, I think, in, in A Course of Miracles, it, it happened because you prayed for it to happen. Or if not you as in you, but it happened because you wanted it to happen. Is a concept in a, a specific teaching, and it's sort of talking about 
you as your higher self um, knowing that this is good for you and so you wanted this to happen. But what these te let, let's leave that one aside because it, but it's another version to think about. It's, it's harder to explain if someone doesn't click with it. The, the other one, it, everything happens for a reason. Right? Is, um, is there to loosen our attitude to um, things that are painful. Ordinarily, the psychological identity will just have an aversion to pain, meaning not just a biological aversion, but an attitudinal aversion, which really is saying, this can't happen the attitude is screaming out, this is an attack on who I am. This can't happen, this is not good. I can't, there's no hope in life because this has happened, is what the psychological identity is screaming out when our ice cream falls on the floor. That's, and, and with any painful situation, in a mini version in, in some instances, in, when the circumstance is not hugely painful, there's still an attitude of attachment, which is basically saying, I need pleasure, pleasure, pleasure. And so when something goes wrong, we lose ourselves and it's completely uncomfortable because we can't see life as being, as working out in that moment. So this concept has been introduced. Everything happens for a reason. And it starts to become a mantra if someone is going through that particular phase and that is the concept that comes to them. It's like, so something goes wrong, you lose your job, and the person will repeat to themselves, oh, everything happens for a reason, which is now introducing this um, softer approach or attitude to what's going on. If that hasn't become part of the system and it doesn't come up like everything happens for a reason, if that's not there, then what happens is there's full involvement with the circumstance and there'll be blame towards the, um, let's say you've lost your job, blame towards the person that fired you, shame because you knew that you weren't working hard enough and you kept saying you had to lift your game and you never did and so then there might be shame. There might be shame because you um, get the sense, you know, I can't hold a job down, I can't ever succeed at anything, I'm always being fired because I'm told I'm not up to standard. And this other attitude, oh, everything happens for a reason, creates a a different perspective, an alternative perspective. Now, what tends to happen in teachings um, and how we, how we hold on to them is we can then make that the new truth. And that's okay for a while because it's breaking the old habit and then it can be a new belief that we don't realize is a belief. Oh, everything's happening for a reason. And it has stopped the thing, but it might actually make us a little bit um, uh, disconnected from the reality of life. Because we can get lost in a concept that makes us a bit ditzy, let's say, spiritually ditzy. Because that's not the truth. We'll we'll go from everything happens to a reason for a reason, and we'll real we'll realize there's something behind. There's a a deeper picture that we have, image that we have behind that statement. Everything happens for a reason. For example, that the universe is benevolently guiding you through um, a process of learning and that that situation has been delivered to you by the universe that knows exactly what is going on and that situation is there for you to learn from and grow 
And at some point we might question, is that true? That the universe is benevolently guiding me through circumstance and delivering exactly what I need? And our thinking might say, oh, actually, it is a learning opportunity. I do learn from experience. And so the principle that it's useful and that I'm learning from it and that I can learn and get benefit out of even something that is unfortunate relative to a different benchmark is, is accurate. But then we might say, but... Is it true that there is, let's say, God out there that is looking down and guiding the circumstance exactly the way, or oh, let me do that so that the person can learn? And we might realize, oh, I have a belief, a belief about that. And so then <laughs> what, has, what was useful, a concept that was very useful, everything happens for a reason, might get adjusted based on our new insight. It's like, I don't want to say everything happens for a reason um, because that was supporting this other image that I had and maybe that image is not truth. So then we say, I want to um, refine this mantra, this r reminder at, on those times when I might, you know, so in fact, we've, the habit has probably been broken by then of taking everything negatively as if it's, you know, the end of your life. That habit has been broken by this thought. Everything happens for a reason. So you can see it's really great. It's really beneficial. And even believing it to be some sort of absolute truth is beneficial at breaking a deeply ingrained belief that is also taking something else, which is, this is the end of my life, this pain means that I can never be happy again. That is a concept that has been taken as absolutely true. And it gets broken because we shift onto another concept that we take as true. And that movement, um, even though it's based on an, the same error, that error will be seen at some point and it will hopefully be corrected. And so that's why Ramana uses this parable, or this, yeah, parable, or analogy, metaphor. Um, and you've all heard it, I'm sure, or many of you have heard it, and you might not really have clicked what it's actually pointing at. I've, I've, I've mentioned it many times. So in the parable it says use this thorn like a rose thorn to help you uproot the deeply embedded rose thorn that's in your thumb and then once you've taken the deeply embedded rose thorn that's in your thumb out using this tool be sure to throw both thorns away so that they don't cause you any trouble now the parable or the metaphor is not there because Ramana thought, oh, that's what they're going to do. They'll use the tool, they'll take the deeply ingrained thorn and then throw the tool away along with the thorn that was the problem. He didn't think that that was going to happen. He knew that the, the, the tool thorn is going to get embedded in the thumb in place of the old thorn because what we're doing is using the tool, not realizing that it's not truth, not realizing it's just a concept, thinking it is truth. In thinking it's truth, it becomes a belief. And where do beliefs go? They get embedded in the thumb. So a thorn embedded in a thumb is a concept that has been taken to be truth and it gets embedded in the thumb. So if we go to Nisargadatta's teaching, the thorn embedded in the thumb, the concept that has been taken to be truth is I am the body. 
This Gadatha says, you are not the body. So there's the, the spiritual concept, you are not the body. And then he says, well, let me add something there. You are consciousness, you are awareness. That, that's the tool. So use that tool to uproot the deeply ingrained belief that you are the body. And that happens. And when that happens, that's the, a block that has been removed. So what happens is our experience changes because the deeply ingrained thorn, which is a belief that says, I am the body, has been removed. So the system starts flowing. The new concept has been inserted. It becomes a new blockage somewhere, but not anywhere near as deeply ingrained as the old one. Well, not for the time being. It depends on your destiny. And so because it has uprooted a, a, a previously and deeply ingrained belief, we have this change in the experience, a change that is beneficial. And because that change happens and we feel better and we feel a relief because a deeply ingrained belief has been removed, it further reinforces the idea that that is truth. Because the experience has changed for the better and it, the, the experience changes in line with what the concept is describing. But the concept is not describing, or the concept is describing what is. Remember, the concept is, is relative. It can't be um, complete, as in it can't be perfect, because it's a set of words. So we don't know that you are not the body, you are consciousness is absolutely the thing itself. And so we have a shift and the consciousness aspect becomes qualitatively known. And because it's been qu it becomes qualitatively known and what has um, uprooted the previous belief is this concept, I am consciousness. I am not the body. So the consciousness presents itself and then we go around and go, what I am is consciousness, not the body. And what if we are the person, which is the body through which consciousness is functioning? And so I describe it as two things, the body through which consciousness is describing. So it, mm -hmm, through which consciousness is functioning. So it sounds like two things, but actually it's a, it's a combination that is never known separately, never exists separately, although the experiences make it feel like they're separate because the concepts have um, become part of our system in a way that the experience then gets felt according to this concept. Um, and then when the experience is like that, we become convinced that that is the truth, especially when um, in order to, for that, this concept to uproot this deeply ingrained concept, and deeply ingrained can mean deeply ingrained. So then some extra concepts need to be added in, like um, knowing yourself as the body is illusion. Knowing yourself as awareness is reality, is the end of illusion, is truth, is direct knowing. And it's not that those w words are um, not relatively correct or relatively accurate. They, they are. It's just that we interpret them and take them to be much more absolute than they are. And the integration can't happen, essentially. We can't know ourselves as the body and consciousness when the concept that has become embedded in the thumb is, now I am not the body, I am consciousness. So Raman has been telling us, be careful not to get that thorn embedded in your thumb, be, be sure to throw it away. 
we're not going to throw away. It's going to get embedded in the thumb, but at least he said, check out and see if it's been embedded in your thumb. And we'll check it out. We'll go, oh, how do I get that out? I guess I need another thorn. So another spiritual concept comes along and says, mm, be careful, you might not be not the body. You might be the person that is the body and consciousness as a combined unit. So use this thorn to take that thorn out. And then be sure to throw both thorns away. What does that mean? That means like you don't even need to keep thinking you're the person. At some point you'll have your own experience that is less influenced by embedded concepts. And you can then rely on the experience. And what's the experience telling you then? My experience tells me I am the person, which is the body through which consciousness functions. So now I'm putting the concept onto the experience. So allow the experience to be in a way that you're not manipulating it, which really means just letting go of trying to always be consciousness for example if you're always trying to if you're always being consciousness because you're convinced you're consciousness and um, have to be witnessing and whatever then your experience is manipulated and so if you then describe the experience you're going to describe it as oh, i am consciousness but that's actually a, a manipulated experience by the idea that you are consciousness anyway that, that becomes we don't need to go into all of that it all sorts itself out So, um, this satsang, the topic was um, to see how we are attached to outcomes. And this attachment to outcomes is built on what I've been talking about. Built on a deeply ingrained belief that my happiness is to be found in outcomes. That my completeness is to be found in pleasure, pleasure, pleasure. Why? Because our experience to date, from a very young age, the way we have developed, is such that this belief identity has been put in place, which means our connection to source has been obscured. Why does it get obscured? Because the thinking is prone or forced even to take the relative as absolute. And when it takes the relative as absolute, we lose sight of the part of ourself that is much less changing than the flow of life aspect of life. So when we make the mistake of taking the very relative, which is all the visuals, all the sights, all the sounds, our feelings, our thoughts, our emotions, all of those, once we start getting onto this topic of what's real and what is changing, and we'll see this is the process of neti neti, not this, not that, not that, not that. So neti neti, not this, not that. So anything you can feel, anything that changes, is not the absolute. It's changing. So when we start to realize all of these things are relative and changing, my thoughts are relative and, and changing. The pleasures and the pains of life are relative and changing. Then the consequence of identifying with the changing as if it's not changing, identifying with the relative as if it's not relative, um, that stops happening. At least it stops happening as much. And then... Because when that happens, it obscures that part of ourself that is much less changing. Because it obscures that, then we start to be able to ground in here. And if we ground in here, we realize that pleasure and pain is not as important as I believed itself, as I believed it to be. Which means the attachment to pleasure and pain falls away. Maybe for a while it's because when the pain happens, we say, 
maybe it's not so bad. Who knows what that will turn into? Which essentially cuts off the identification and the attachment with pleasure and allows us to rest. Over here, ah, you see, how nice when I don't jump to conclusions, which is taking something relative and turning it into absolute. I get to rest here. And there's silence here because the noise is the freak out, which is the attitudinal freak out, meaning what that means about me, because we've lost touch with the core of who we are. So the concept in the teaching that says the flow of life, which means circumstance as it unfolds moment after moment after moment, the flow of life is either pleasure or pain. That's all. All of life, whatever you can imagine, the circumstance you can imagine is either pleasure or pain financial pleasure or pain, physical pleasure or pain, emotional pleasure or pain. And emotional pleasure or pain doesn't mean suffering. It will be pleasurable if the circumstance is in line with your biological preferences, what you would like, what you do like biologically, your preferences. And it will be painful if the circumstance is out of line with your biological preferences. So that's a concept. It's a concept describing the actuality of life. If we think about it and start to see, so th this is saying whatever you think about or actually whatever happens in your life is either pleasure or pain, nothing more. So it's, it's encouraging us to see the flat tire on our car. When we go out in the morning, we're late for work and you see the flat tire. Right? That's part of circumstance, part of the flow of life. It's either pleasure or pain, nothing more than that. It fits into that spectrum of circumstance, which means pleasure or pain. It'll be pleasurable if it's in line with your biological preferences, painful if it's not in line with your biological preferences. So when you're late for work and you find that you have a flat tire, it's not what you would like. So it's painful. If you miss your aeroplane and it costs you $2,000 for a new ticket because you thought you were leaving at 6 at night and in fact you get to the airport and the um, security guard says, oh, your plane left 12 hours ago. What? And it's a $2,000 loss. You have to buy a new ticket. That's financial pain, not in line with your biological preferences, not what you would like. If you get news that a friend that you love dearly, that you haven't seen for three years, is um, by surprise 10 minutes away from your house, that's emotional pleasure. It's part of your biological pleasure. If you get news that a friend that you love has died, that's emotional pain. So circumstance only delivers pleasure or pain. Our suffering is always our attitude to the pleasure or pain in the flow of life. And the attitude to the pleasure or pain in the flow of life adds on top of the pain of the moment the pain of the circumstance, it adds on top of the biological pain of the circumstance, a load of uncomfortableness with oneself, a load of guilt and blame and pride and expectation. So the concept, whatever happens in circumstance, whether you lose your job, whether your brother steals your best um, you know, set of jeans, pair of jeans or whatever, is circumstance, whether you go into the kitchen and the kids have left it in an absolute mess, that's circumstance, right? The parents have no hope of loving their children. 
if when they see this, the kitchen in a shambles, which is pain, if the attitude of attachment to outcome kicks in, which is the attitude that takes the pain, takes the circumstance, and says, this means something about who I am. We then have to hate that person that delivers the pain. So some, a parent will say, I don't hate my child. You know, because hate is reserved usually as a fairly intense emotion. Hatred. The principle of hatred is, you hurt me, I hate you. And that attitude um, is an attitude towards the flow of life which is based on this attachment to outcome, the belief that my happiness, my completeness, who I am, is dependent on life being pleasure, 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 pleasure. So the reason I was going through that step by step is because that's what the concepts and the teachings are, are there for to try and get us to hear it and say why is this important oh they're all important because they all link into happiness for the human being which is not happiness because of seeing your friend that's pleasure not happiness because you win the lottery that's pleasure it's happiness in the form of unbroken peace of mind Unbroken peace of mind means the absence of guilt, blame, pride, worry, and expectation. And that set of uncomfortableness ceases when we stop taking the pleasure and pain of life as being important to who I am. And what I'm completely amazed at is seeing how this circumstance that we're in is um, changing people such that the attachment to outcome is really coming out onto the surface in people's posts, which you can see are completely attached to circumstance. They're completely lost in circumstance, in outcomes. So teaching my happiness is not to be found in outcomes means if I, if I lose myself in outcomes, thinking that my happiness is to be found in outcomes, I have lost my happiness. I've lost my peace of mind. Because attachment to outcomes means resistance to life. It means hating the other. It means hating oneself. So ask yourself, what is your attitude to outcomes really? Not intellectually where you say oh i'm not attached to outcomes i mean what happens to you if you imagine that you are forced to pay 20 percent more taxes than you did in previous years to pay back the economic reliefs that are being put in place at the moment what happens if you're forced to have a vaccine when you don't want it what happens if your neighbor says, I'm not going to have a vaccine when you actually are in favor of vaccines? Right? Those are all outcomes. They're not important beyond a circumstantial pleasure or pain. And if your reaction, when you think about that, is, it, you know, that just can't be. That means there's attachment to outcomes. So if you see it, this is great, because it means don't judge yourself about it. Just see, oh, that's there. And now attention can come on to seeing it, and the more it sees it, the more the game is up. So the, the problem is we can have the concept, my happiness isn't, to be, and not realize what it's actually talking about. We think we understand. We think that um, we understand my happiness isn't to be found in outcomes. And yet, as soon as um, you know, someone has a different opinion or isn't functioning the way you would like them to function, we go into 
a horizontal attitude that this is somehow got something to do with defining who I am, that this is an attack on who I am, and we lose our center. So in this, inv in this um, time, it's a great opportunity for us to see when we've lost our center, when we've become involved in circumstance. Circum you're not allowed to go out of the house, it's circumstance. You don't have any toilet paper because your neighbor bought 15 bags of it. That's circumstance. It's an opportunity to keep coming back and saying, what is the uncomfortableness about? What circumstance is it about? And if we can see what circumstance it's about, we can see that we want life to be different. In that moment, it can get cut off and we can find ourselves back here because our happiness isn't dependent on circumstance. Our unhappiness is dependent on our attitude to circumstance. And our peace, what we could say our happiness, is also dependent on our circumstance. So once we see uh, sorry, dependent on our attitude. So once we see that the uncomfortableness is because of an attitude towards circumstance and it gets cut off, we find we're centered again, which is why spiritual teachings are saying you don't have to go anywhere. You don't have to achieve anything to be happy. It's about turning inwards and that can happen in an instant. In the instance, you realize that your thinking for hours and days is about the government. Right? In an instant, you can find yourself at peace. If your system has understood um, enough that the flow of life is pleasure or pain, understood that life is always going to be a mix and a changing pleasure and pain. You can never make it pleasure, 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 pleasure. You can't ever get the world population to see life your way to do exactly what you want. Hmm. All right, well, we'll see if we have some questions. Hi, Holger. Hi, Holger. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Great. Okay, um, my video doesn't start, but um, that's fine. That's okay. Go um, ahead. Wow. Um, I'm speechless right now, but um, so wonderful. Um, I don't want to get lost in feeling wonderful. I mean, um, let's cut this off. But I would like a confirmation from you. Or is there a way to check in if I'm just fooling myself with this amaz amazing peace I'm feeling? This is just another trick of my old sneaky ego or whatever it is. I mean, how do you... It, it's self-confirming, right? You see, even this... It is, yes, yes, the, yes, yes. Even yes, the yes, question yes. that says, am I fooling myself, might actually be coming in and disturbing the peace of mind. No, it doesn't. Yeah. I mean, it's just an old habit, kind of. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the, that the trick is that it really is um, self-confirming. So often in, in seeking, we want... Um, confirmation sometimes now there's two sorts of confirmation there is very much a confirmation where a, <clears throat> a, a teaching can say you know that's exact you know that's it um or describe something and you say oh thanks for saying it that way it confirms something for me it's just what i needed to hear here <clears throat> it was more of a confirmation rather than a revelation so there is that but we also sometimes have to see how some remnants of attachment to outcome are still thinking that happiness is about pleasure in a very subconscious way. And so it's looking for um, a 
affirmation in a way. And um, this thing about it's it's self confirming is like wow well, you know it, it's really what what um, it's saying peace of mind is not something. It just is the absence of suffering, and when the absence of suffering is there, it's like ah what a relief, and it isn't about the whole world congratulating anyone let's say because um and i'm not i'm not saying this because i think that's what you're doing but it's a very um when i said it's self-confirming this is um a subtlety that um i know i didn't see until i saw it when i saw it that subtlety that was thinking i'm going to get something by people appreciating um my freedom uh, and when I saw that that is forgetting or missing the point that the peace is in itself what we're looking for and so if I overlook that for an instant then I go out with the old habit of trying to get pleasure um, from some sort of affirmation or confirmation from outside and uh, this is a very subtle thing. Um, and when we see it, we go, oh, I don't need any confirmation because the peace is in itself enough. It isn't about what anyone else thinks. Um, and that becomes our, um, the thing that takes any doubt away as well. Once we start to be able to really appreciate it is the peace is self-confirming which is this um uh, what's often referred to as the <clears throat> the peace that surpasses or uh, what is it the peace that um as this understanding yes that's it it because it it isn't about gaining anything um and so that's why our understanding can't grasp this piece because our understanding is often, you know, looking at everything as cause and effect. And this is a causeless piece. It's like, wow, it doesn't require the outside to conform, which is the freedom. That's why we can be free because it's our own internal peace, not dependent on outcomes. And um, so uh, there's also sometimes this continued mistake even um when the teaching keeps saying it's about peace of mind it's not about a state or whatever and then someone has a shift in in consciousness or a realization and they are focused on that state let's say and then if the state falls away then they feel like something is missing um and so continually I keep wanting to point back to the peace of mind being self-confirming and that's all that's important. And Ramesh used to say to someone um, or if people would um, come and share their changed experience, really what he wanted to hear, because often people would come and talk about states or realizations and really he wanted to know, so do you have more peace of mind in your life? <laughs> Is there more peace of mind? Um, and someone might think, might not even appreciate the value of him asking that question because they might be still focusing on the state, some, some fancy state, let's say. Um, and if, 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 the, if we're continually directed inward, go and check for yourself. Check, check for yourself how the understanding is. Because... Um, another thing Ramesh used to say is enlightenment is not a certifiable event. No one can tell you, oh, there you go, I certify you as enlightened. If it's certifiable, it's only self-certifiable by having the correct litmus test, which is peace of mind. So please, if you've, if you've got this overflowing peace of mind, don't, don't question it because it's, it's your answer. It's so wonderful. I mean, this is, um, I see the trap of identifying again with something. I mm -hmm. mean, this mechanism of 
but it's not there. I mean, because this, uh, but I am still here. I mean, but not as an idea. It's just, um, yeah. it's just super wonderful. It's nice. And it's um, whatever it is, it's, uh, it is. Yeah. So the one, the one wanting something isn't there, right? Yes, the, yes, yes, and I see this trap. I mean, this is so beautiful with how simply you explain the whole thing. To see the mechanism how I created my own um, suffering through my life, and I cannot even blame myself. This is so beautiful. Yeah, because the I that created that really is was simply a um, mechanical structure, right? That you didn't put in place. But still. Yes, but but still, I don't feel like a machine. I mean, mm -hmm. there is some aliveness inside of me. Oh and, yeah, yeah. Uh, We're this is a, a very alive machine. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's okay, a, a machine. Everything, with everything you, you go on, go on. Everything you say, everything you say is a concept again, just to recalibrate my sense of self. Yes. Yeah. At the end of the day, yes, I yes, mean, I would yes, hope yes, someone yes. goes to their experience of, um, which is what you're saying, you know, you feel alive, yes, because the machine is a, a life-infused machine. Um, so, not necessarily a machine according to a concept we have of machine, but uh, um, you go to your experience and you can go, oh, okay, so it's a machine in that sense. Um, so, really... Uh, using the experience, your own experience, as the basis on which the concept then has to fit, rather than the other way around. Wow, wonderful. Thank you so much. And I see so much beauty. I can experience so much beauty just by listening to you. And I must admit that my thinking is really immature, And uh, but even this is fine because it will just unfold in whatever way it unfolds. Well, maybe it's not as immature as you think. It's nice uh, nice talking to you, Holger. Ditto. And I would love to call you brother, um, just in a very um, heartfelt way and without any expectation and without any attachment. Sure, that brother is fine. In, in fact, um, I don't know, I don't use it too often, but um, we're all in this together as brothers and sisters. Um, yes, uh, yes, this yeah. is so amazing. Yeah. Um, and what a gift! What a gift! What a gift to be disturbed by someone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because yeah, they're <laughs> just the instrument through which our destiny is being delivered, and that—that's the basis Confirming. on which. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So um, that's uh, that was Ramesh would say. You know, once we don't see the other as the doer anymore, then we can see that we're all in this together as universal brothers and sisters, instruments, all instruments through which the one consciousness is functioning. So much. <laughs> Thank you, Holger. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Hello, Isabel. Hello, how are you, Roger? Hello, nice to see you. Um, I have a, a question about um, something that escaped from my understanding. Um, when it, it, it's about it's about being uh, one. Mm -hmm. It's like uh, it's always the same thing. I'm, so it's not something I, it's, I, I find myself as a seeker, but in fact, I don't know really what I'm seeking, and it it, it doesn't make me um, uncomfortable about not finding. I, I see myself more like uh, I would, um, for example, um, uh, as a painter, I, I, I want to realize um, a frame. Mm. And then uh, I say, uh, I, I, there's something I want there to go. And I, I, I work on it. And it, it doesn't come up as, as, I, as I wish, which it, it doesn't matter. I like uh, seeking. 
Mm-hmm. It's there until there. <laughs> yeah. And so um, then my teacher comes and say, well, if you mix this color, for example, blue and yellow, mm-hmm. then you will have green. And then maybe that will help for for your 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 painting Mm -hmm. and then i say i will try Mm -hmm. and so it's like if i'm 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 i i I would like or attend which is not really attending i don't know how to put it it's just is it just life that would give me this trick or this thing or I, I I don't know I don't know how how to to understand this so it's it, it, it's not I, I don't even know if it will be better once I know that it's just something as the frame is not okay for me f- do you see what I mean okay so what but what do you think that you're needing to understand. Because you started off saying you have a, you have a, a question I, about oneness. Yes, that's how how how. What's missing in what do I don't understand? That because I have peace of mind, really. Uh, um, it's I. I have that. I. You know. Um, so now you want something I, more. I, <laughs> Well, yes, it's like it's like. Uh, I don't have any. You know, w- w- you, w- when you don't understand something, that uh, it, it, it's it's not that I'm not in peace of mind. All I think is fine, but it's really like a, a, a seeker that would uh, uh, seek for a vaccine, for example. Okay, so it's fine, but he would like that uh, to 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 in order, for example, to to help others. He would like to find this vaccine. Mm-hmm. So, so, but, but, it's, but he, yeah, so, but this is the thing. I don't have anything more than peace of mind. Right. So, I mean, I don't have oneness um, as a oneness experience. I've had oneness experiences. I was attached to them and they happened a lot while I was attached to them. And then when I realized it has nothing to do with oneness experiences, which was the end of my attachment to them, they stopped happening. And I can't be happier. It, it's just uh, as simple as, uh, as that. Well, it, it's as simple as that. If you're making the mistake, which you might be, I don't know, of thinking, well, oneness is much more important than peace of mind. Um, and I would like to have oneness. Because if that's the case, you're making a big mistake, right? Because if that's the case, you're saying what I'm really looking for, what's available in life, what the seeking is all about is oneness. And I don't have oneness. I have peace of mind, but, you know, it's really about oneness. And so I would like oneness. Um, Now, if that's uh, what is in your thinking, maybe unconsciously, understand that you have an expectation not necessarily an expectation of um, being attached to oneness, although that tends to happen when we have an expectation, but also expectation in the form of maybe a wrong idea about what liberation is. If we have this idea and it hasn't been uprooted, even though the teachings say, you know, what are the talks about? They're, they're about happiness for the human being, which is peace of mind, Um, liberation is the end of suffering, which is peace of mind. So, I mean, I repeat it many times a day saying, what we're really looking for, whether we realize it or not, is unbroken peace of mind. Enlightenment is unbroken peace of mind. The Buddha has said, enlightenment is the end of suffering. The end of suffering is peace of mind. So, um, you know, the teaching keeps saying what we should have in our mind as the answer to the question, what will we get after enlightenment that we don't have before? The answer to that question, if um, our up-to-date conditioning has been changed sufficiently, won't be oneness. 
The answer will be, well, I as the doer that wants something won't get anything because peace of mind comes when that identity falls away. However, what will set in, what will be there, because that's really what the question is asking, what will be there is the end of suffering, which is peace of mind. So ask yourself if you have maybe still got this idea that enlightenment is oneness and not peace of mind. Because really, I really feel this peace of mind. Uh, uh, the, the, and you, you were very um, uh, um, helpful those, in those last satsangs saying, for example, when, when emotions uh, arise, it's, it's maybe just your, uh, a reaction from the body. Because uh, I used to think, no, that's because... Uh, you, you you are not so peaceful as you you mm-hmm. you say but then uh, no it it's not that i, I really uh, find it's it's all right so it's uh, so w- uh, again it, I, I don't want, i i don't i don't know what is enlightenment i i don't i don't i i, I cannot i cannot even think about something i don't know what it is and and plus as it, it's but you not, said you just uh, said you had peace of mind yes i have peace of mind so why don't you know it's what enlightenment the, is uh okay i see your question because um, maybe i didn't rela- uh, um, make the relation be- between uh uh between both there's oh, no, so that's it. There's no relationship. They're the same thing. <laughs> they are the same thing. Yeah. Well, that's great. There you go. <laughs> that's what I mean. <laughs> that's that's why I try. That's what I tell everyone that ten times in each satsang. <laughs> then that's uh, that, that that's wonderful. Yeah. So now you have so, you don't need to have any expectation for something more. No. No. And you'll find that that expectation that might have been there in a subtle way was possibly the last thing that was in the way of your unbroken peace of mind. That's great. Mm. It's it's really a good news. (laughs) Yeah. It's the falling away of a a layer of subtle suffering. um, And it is. That's one of the last... Um, realizations is oh I already have um, the peace of mind except for me thinking it's about something more because when we think it's about something more then the thing we have gets sort of put to the side and says oh yeah I have that but now what I really need is enlightenment (laughs) and it takes us sometimes we have to realize oh this is it that's just incredible Mm. It's great. <laughs> Very good. Thank you, Roger. Really, I'm 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 so happy to hear this. Really, I let you know what <laughs> what's going on the uh, about that coming in. Yeah, I hope you find yourself laughing a lot at how funny uh, <laughs> yes life is. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So great. Thank you, Roger. Really, really. All right. Thank you. See you. Bye bye. I keep uh, Hello Frank Hi Frank I need now okay there you Hey are. hey Roger how are you Yeah very good I was trying to unmute myself Yeah no I I really really appreciate your your teachings Thank you. I've been watching you uh, for quite a while. I really appreciate you. And um, I have a question about 12-step programs. I've been doing uh, 12-step programs for a long time. Um, mm-hmm. I'm currently in one for uh, adult children of alcoholics. Uh, and uh, I sort of feel like I'm, in, in some ways, because I do the non-dualist stuff too, and I listen to you, and I, and I know about the, uh, you know, the uh, attachment to outcomes, mm-hmm. uh, I'm realizing that when I do these steps, and uh, like I'm working on step four right now, I'm really 
realizing that um, I'm, I'm looking for that outcome of, you know, being a better person, being a nicer person, uh, you know, all these outcomes in my mind as a way to make me happy. Sure. And, so, the, and this teaching is not well, about being a better person, well, right? Okay, please. Can you talk about that? That's really what I want you to share on if you could. Thanks. I'd appreciate it. Yeah, sure. Remind me what uh, step, four, step four is. Well, step four, uh, well, in this program that I'm in now, it's about really looking at family history and what really happens. Mm -hmm. My dad was an alcoholic and all this, and so I became, I also became an alcoholic. So I'm looking at my side of the, of the fence, so what I've done wrong in my life and what my parents did. You know, not, it's not an, a blaming thing. It's just, you're just kind of looking at it neutrally, hopefully, mm -hmm. without blame or shame. Uh, but it's all about, you know, improving myself as a person. Yeah. So I'm wondering what your take on that is. Um, yeah. Uh, so I think there's a lot of merit in looking at, um, because we can easily t t turn, so one of the concepts in the teachings, because it's important, says peace of mind is not about becoming a perfect human being. Uh, we're always going to have our good points and our bad points. And... Uh, liberation is about witnessing the good points in action and at other times our less than good points in action. So our good points and our shortcomings. Often we might have the idea that liberation is about becoming a saint. And that's actually, it's almost a flip, you know, it's almost uh, back to front. If we think it's about becoming a saint, we're essentially going to be attached to becoming um, a pleasure delivering machine. So we will see our, expect ourselves to be delivering pleasure, 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 pleasure to the world. Um, and that really is exactly the error um, which the teaching is trying to say, to, to get us to let go of. Um, so it says the flow of life is sometimes pleasure and sometimes pain and the body and its biological and psychological functioning, in particular the biological functioning, is part of that flow of life. So it will be sometimes pleasure and sometimes pain. And if we can see that the body is going to function according to its design and its makeup and that's not in our control, then the attitude can be the attitude of witnessing life happen as it always is changing sometimes pleasure and sometimes pain and the body's actions the body's behaviors are part and parcel of that flow of life so a witnessing it now that doesn't mean that we should use that concept the concept that says it's not about becoming a perfect person to overlook uh, and to prevent us from discerning what aspects um, or what is happening through us that is maybe delivering pain to others. So if we, if, we're, if we don't discern, which doesn't mean judge, so this is where this can align very well with step four, because step four, based on how you described it, is really, um, it very much depends how you interpret it, right? Because it could be very... Um, easy for the seeker in the 12 steps to say, oh, what it's telling me is I need to become a better person or a perfect person. Um, and maybe what it's saying is let's just look back without burying our head in the sand, without trying to justify things. Um, let's just look back on the past and call a spade a spade and say, yes, that wasn't... Um, very thoughtful behavior. You know, I did treat this person with um, contempt for many years, you could say. And that doesn't mean that you should then go into shame, but at least you're realizing, yes, that wasn't um, uh, kind to that person. But simultaneously, hopefully, there is an understanding that I really couldn't have functioned differently. It wasn't your intention to be unkind to someone. It's just that, you know, when certain things are at play, that's all that's available. Um, and, you know, this idea, this notion, this seeing that I'm not the doer, really feeling, you know, that you had no scope to function differently in that moment. Um, 
allows a looking back and a discerning, meaning a, just an objective um, assessment of things. And, and that's honesty, right? That's authenticity. So the fact that I'm not the doer doesn't mean that we can't say that the actions happening through this body-mind delivered pain. We can say it delivered pain, but it wasn't my doing. But don't let's not use it as an excuse. And there's this very um, nice, fine line where everything fits together. And I think that's what step four is... Um, is really getting you to do and if i'm not mistaken in that step or maybe one of the following steps it even asks you to um, apologize to the people is that right are you still with me is it muted Oh, I'll um, I'll just finish the answer anyway. Um, yes, uh, I'm not. Uh, you, I was I was muted. I couldn't unmute myself. Uh huh. Okay. Yes. Uh, what was your question again? Um, it actually asks you to apologize to people. I think, if I'm not mistaken, right? Well, that's that's another step down the line. So it's, it's like step seven or something like that, or step eight or something like that. Yeah, uh, right. it does. Um, yeah, but I, I think I'm I'm sort of looking at it now uh, as a way to like you were saying, just just review my life and see what you know. Without the shame and the blame and the uh, the doership thing, which is the doership thing, is still a little bit uh, confusing for me. But I'm that's why I keep coming and listening to you because I really want to get that. And I know that I may and I may not get that, but I, am, I keep coming to, yeah, well, to listen. Well, so the the doership really is um, is the key of um, understanding that we may not be well. We're not going to be perfect, a, a perfect person. Um, because people aren't designed to be perfect people. And if they are, if someone is designed to be pretty good, like pretty perfect, they're just the, the lucky one, right, that got stamped out to have that design. It wasn't because they've um, worked hard. Um, really, it means they've got a very fortunate makeup that means they act... Um, with very few shortcomings, which really means less pain to people around them and less pain for themselves. Um, so the non-doership is the real is really realizing, wow, you know, if I have an IQ of seventy or an IQ of one hundred and forty, is not my doing. It's like that's the faculty I was given. Um, if I found myself, um, you know, feeling uncomfortable in life such that drinking became the um, solution that wasn't um, something that a doer uh, a separate independent me that could have chosen to do life differently that wasn't something that this me doer chose and should have done it differently um, so the notion of doership is really saying wow there isn't anyone here I mean, there is, uh, quite clearly, there is the experience of Roger, but there isn't anyone as a, as a me controller. So even the thoughts that we have, um, that might be a great idea, and then we say, oh, that's it, I'm going to do that, and tomorrow we enact it. That's not the doing of a, a separate me, but rather that's the unfolding of life, and it started off, you know, from your birth, and then you could say, well, actually, it was your mum's birth and your mum's mum's birth. That, And in this moment, life is manifesting as that thought, great idea that you didn't create, it just arose. You don't know what the next thought is going to be. It's a surprise once it happens. And so this thought happened, and it was a great idea. And so the next day, because that thought arose, you put in place some program, let's say, that helps people. And the recognition of non-doership is the recognition that, wow, you know, all of this happened because that thought happened. And the thought happened because who knows why? 
the complexity of the universe, um, where we where we miss is that we think we created the thought. And rather, when we look closely, we see thoughts pop up and you don't know what your next thought is going to be. It's probably inspired by me saying you don't know what your next thought is going to be. Uh, intellectually, let's say, but I do feel like I still have that tension in my body mm -hmm. and I have a hard time believing that people don't know what they're doing. Uh, like I've seen situations where people go after other people, they come after me and they've you know, they're, they're like malicious with a very, they seem to be very in, intently malicious, very willfully malicious, and they seem to know what they're doing. So to me, that's still a little bit of a, there's still a little, a little bit of a gap between my understanding of what, what doership could mean and, and what I experience with people and how they, they're very willful in what they do, and they seem to know exactly what they're doing. Yeah. But so hopefully so I'll, I'll get to some point. Yeah. Um, the, the experience changes as the understanding gets more subtle. So, so just what, what you've just put forward, I guess, is um, maybe a confusion with willfulness and doership. Because if, if we see someone who is saying, you know, I'm making a plan to get you, right? You're not going to get away with that. Um, and then they put it in place. Um, we might say, well, he's the doer, you know, he's the one that said, I'm going to get you. Um, what we need to realize is even that the, the thought and the makeup of the person such that that thought arises in them is because of their makeup. In another person, that thought, that willfulness to get revenge just wouldn't happen, right? Um, so the, the willfulness of you know, your neighbor, let's say, or someone um, at a sports club or whatever to to get you is is happening and not their doing. Um, and so it requires us to really see, wow, we are biological and psychological instruments functioning exactly according to our design and our design will throw up our thoughts and our motivations um, and it's usually, um, it'll start off by us seeing our willfulness in, our, in ourselves, for example. So if you have a feeling to get revenge on someone yourself, um, you might realize that that feeling is, is arising. You know, it's, um, and you'll know it's not a nice feeling. It's like, I want, I want to um, get payback. So you might see that feeling arise and that thought arise and then the strategizing afterwards. And there might be the capacity to see this is um, coming because of something that happened when I was very young, because of the way, let's say, my father was and said, you know, you should never let anyone get away with it. Um, and then the feeling arises inside of us to not let them get away with it. And we realize this is because my father told me that's how things should be. And you say, I wasn't in control of what, which father I was given. Um, I wasn't in control of how he saw life. And so his conditioning on, um, on my life is new conditioning by life, new conditioning coming through your father, which is going to influence our genes and up-to-date conditioning which we're not in control of. And then that is going to influence these feelings that we have that come up. And so that's where we can go, wow, I'm not the doer of my anger, my resentment, let's say. And if we can see that in ourselves, then it starts to become easier to understand the non-doership of the same sort of movement in someone else. So hopefully... Um, thanks, thanks for that. Appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, Roger. Yeah. I've got more, but I'll, I'll, I'll wait for another day. Okay. Because I know we're coming to the end, so I'll wait uh, till next time. Thanks, Roger. Appreciate you. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. See you. Um, all right. Well, I think um, we can call it, a, call it a day. So remember, your happiness is not to be found in the flow of life. Your happiness is not to be found in pleasure or pain. The flow of life is only ever pleasure or pain.